Hi, I'm Benjamin Morgan, the Chief Executive of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association of Australia, and I'd like to welcome everybody back for our Facebook Live panel discussion uh, for this Tuesday, the 18th uh, of August. Uh, tonight, we're going to be catching up with representatives of the Sport Aircraft Association of Australia and the Gliding Federation of Australia uh, to have an open and candid conversation about how a lack of CASA reform is holding back the sport aviation sectors throughout Australia. I'd like to welcome all of our viewers uh, and encourage you all, if you have questions or comments, uh, please feel free to post them uh, into the comment section below and we'll do our best to direct your questions uh, through to tonight's panellists. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to start this evening by welcoming Tony White. Uh, Tony is the president of the Sport Aircraft Association. He's quite active uh, in the sport and experimental aircraft movement in Western Australia. And thank you, Tony, for giving up your time tonight. Yeah, thanks, Ben, for the invitation. I look forward to it. That's no problem at all. Next up, we have Peter Sesco. Peter is the outgoing president of the Gliding Federation of Australia. I've done a fair bit of work with Peter over the last couple of years. Uh, Peter has a huge passion for all things gliding, so thank you very much, Peter, for joining us. No problems. Lucky to be here, is my opinion. So, thank you. <laughs> thanks, mate. And last, but lucky last, is Gary Weeks. Gary is uh, a member of the National Council of the Sport Aircraft Association. Uh, has been an airline pilot uh, and involved in Australia's aviation industry for some time. And recently, Gary, you finished up uh, with Qantas on the 787. That's correct. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming along tonight. And I know uh, many people probably know you, Gary, from the, the LOBO, the, the Landsair Owners Builders Organisation as well. Yeah, that's that's a, a small group of um, yeah, Landsair Owners and Builders here in Australia that I'm fairly passionate about. Uh, one of the founding members of that uh, little group and uh, we take the airplane pretty seriously and that's uh, just another area where safety and training and uh, and knowing the airplane uh, and type transition training is most important yeah well fantastic and i know there's uh, there's plenty of people out there that are interested in some of those machines they're getting uh, awfully attractive for those of us within the certified world that are looking for a a real viable alternative so we'll come back to that a little bit later in the program well, gentlemen, the purpose of tonight is to have an open and candid conversation about how we feel and see that a lack of reform uh, within CASA and reform of CASA's regulations are impacting sport aviation and its movement forward here in Australia. And I guess maybe the best place to start with this, Tony, is to get a bit of an overview of the SAAA and where you see uh, some of those challenges and how they are impacting uh, on your organisation. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ben. Um, look, one of the, the big challenges uh, that we think uh, needs to be looked at far more quickly than what is being done is medical reform for, for all pilots. Uh, I mean, we have a scenario uh, where the industry has been sectionalised by CASA uh, and some people enjoy uh, within the aviation community uh, quite a relaxed standard for medical. Uh, but if you're in the experimental sector and you, you register your aircraft with CASA as a VH registration, um, you know, the best you, you can get is a class two basic, which is uh, akin to a commercial truck driver's uh, license uh, on Ausroads. Uh, this is uh, significantly uh, a detriment to uh, the, the community of aviators uh, who want to fly experimental. Uh, and have their aeroplanes registered with CASA. Uh, the alternative, of course, is uh, you, you have to uh, go to a private organisation um, where you can get a recreational uh, pilot's licence or, or a um, uh, rec recreation pilot certificate, which, which is uh, uh, quite different to, to you know, what we need to f uh, have to fly an experimental aircraft. Uh, so, so, so Tony, I'll, I'll just quickly, I'm going to jump in there and we're going to come back to the issue of the pilot medicals very shortly because it is such a key issue uh, facing the broader sport community. Uh, but those, of, uh, those uh, ministers and senators and government people that will be joining us for tonight's uh, broadcast and also those that will be reviewing this broadcast uh, after, it's been, after it has been live, for those people, could you give us, a, an over, uh, I guess, an overview of the Sport Aircraft Association? Which particular area of the industry does the SAAA sit? Uh, what is your membership comprised of and the type of aircraft that uh, your community are flying? 
Uh, well, the Sport Aircraft uh, Association is uh, comprised of approximately a thousand uh, Australians who, who are in the process of building and or flying uh, the aircraft that, that uh, they have constructed themselves. Uh, in addition, uh, amongst them, we have a, a, a small component of our membership who have purchased uh, experimental aircraft. But in the main, the difference with an experimental aircraft is that uh, you get the right to build it and maintain it yourself. And then once you've done a phase one uh, test flying period, uh, you can apply for phase two. And effectively, when you're in that uh, arena, your aeroplane is no different than any other type certified aircraft. Yet we are still tagged as being experimental because we're not built in a, in a certified factory world. We're built by an individual in his in his home garage or in his home hangar, um, and and that's that's the primary difference. But we conform to the same rules, and we're complied to conform to the same rules as the certified rule, uh, certified world, uh, and that's quite different to what most people would understand as recreational aviation. So there's there's some significant differences which create this unlevel playing field, which I talked about. Medical is one. Uh, maintenance on your aircraft is another. Uh, if you build it, you're allowed to maintain it yourself. Um, but if you don't build it, then you're not allowed to maintain it at all. It has to go to a Lamy uh, and a Lamy shop, just like a certified aircraft. Uh, there's, no, there's no rules at this point in time which allow us to do those things which you know, our, our brothers in... in uh, aviation uh, on the ultralight world enjoy um, and th this is a significant barrier to to people uh, in our part of aviation uh, because it makes it uh, more expensive uh, in in terms of maintaining medicals I mean, where you know most of the aviators in Australia are a bit older now so we're up against uh, uh, an AVMED department, which think we all should be 25 and flying around in jets. Uh, and that, that, that medical criteria that we have to, to try and get past every uh, two years is a lot different than somebody who just self-certifies. And, and yet most of our members are flying exactly the same types of machines in exactly the same part of the airspace. Uh, that our brothers at uh, RALs are, are flying. And it just makes it a bit of a, uh, a travesty of uh, the whole system that we have these double standards. Gary, I'll throw the question across to you. I mean, the, the vast majority of sport and experimental aircraft that are flying are not uh, possibly what the, you know, I guess, the average person might consider sport and experimental to be an aeroplane where you've got to wear an orange suit and a helmet and wear a parachute to dare fly it. I mean... This couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, we're talking about a community that are flying um, probably some of the most uh, reliable and sophisticated aeroplanes that are available in general aviation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're a pretty privileged uh, bunch of people. Um, there's no doubt about that. Our um, aircraft in the experimental world, the uh, VH registered, as Tony um, said, we don't get any free kicks for the certification or... Uh, standards of equipment or anything like that um, to fly in whatever airspace. I mean, you've got to remember that we've got um, IFR aeroplanes, we've got uh, pressurised aeroplanes, we've got jets, turboprops, pistons. Uh, it covers a wide array of aeroplanes, but um, it's an expanding uh, sector of general aviation uh, because there's just so many... Um, uh, options out there. You've only got to look at the Vans series of aeroplanes and if you can't find uh, amongst the, uh, the, the the various Vans models, if you can't find something you 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 like, um, there's plenty of other places to go and look, but um, the options are endless um, and it's, yeah, it's just one of the most enjoyable things you'll ever get to do. So we see the sport and experimental side of the aviation industry is uh, is split up. We'll talk for a moment on powered aviation, but sport uh, sport aviation uh, is really defined as the recreational community, the sport experimental community, uh, the uh, in many cases the antique aeroplane community, and also the warbird community. 
Um, but I think it would be fair to say that the area that there is probably more commonality between your organisation is probably that with the uh, Recreational Aviation Australia in which we have, um, on the whole, pilots that are participating in flying because it's fun, they enjoy it, they like going out to the airport on the weekend. In your particular organisation's case, uh, what I've seen, Tony, is a, a huge demonstration of pride of ownership and pride of build. Uh, obviously, uh, we, you know, from an AOPA's perspective, we don't see any difference in the people that make up this community. We see them as pilots. They, they fly for fun. I mean, how do you see it? I mean, is there any real difference between a recreational pilot and someone who is flying privately or recreationally within the sport uh, aircraft side? Well... It's a good question, Ben. And, and actually, no, I don't see there's a lot of difference anymore. I mean, once upon a time uh, when the ultralight movement was uh, literally flying around in rag and tube and using uh, chainsaw motors and, and the like, and, and they were limited to 300 feet and, and uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, it, yes, it was different. And, and in fact, uh, uh, the ultralight uh, movement and, and the SAAA movement grew out of the same uh, group of people, but they split many years ago uh, because of uh, the, the ultimately the change in rules. And uh, it's it's a bit sad that we've got a scenario now where effectively the ultralight uh, group uh, effectively are flying the same type of machines. Uh, some of the RV range, uh, uh, certainly uh, a lot of the other uh, VH range uh, aeroplanes, uh, Technams, for example. Uh, are in there. And, and what's weird about the whole situation is that uh, back back in 2002-ish, uh, around there, uh, as a consequence of uh, the Holcroft report back in the late uh, 80s, 90s, um, this whole uh, um, experiment, if you like, of uh, what's now RAOs came to be. And, and I've been trying to wrap my head around how CASA actually used the act where it defines unregisterable aircraft to then set these ultralight aeroplanes aside outside of the act and the cars of 1988 and cr create uh, literally a CAO 9555 as a mechanism to control these aircraft um, and, and the whole lot sits completely outside of effectively the Act. It sits outside of Australia's compliance to ICAO. Um, I mean, I read a paper uh, sent to me uh, by Ken Kinane just, just uh, today, uh, looking into you know, what Australia has complied with, with its ICAO uh, um, position. And um, you know, how in God's name did CASA allow a set of rules to develop which actually treats a registrable aeroplane that's not registered by the country. Uh, I mean, it's, it says in ICAO you can't do that. It says that all aircraft in a country must be under the registration of the state. Um, and yet that doesn't happen uh, with, with um, effectively the RA's Oz aeroplanes. Now, I'm not, I don't want to be seen here as bashing RA Oz, you know, because that's been a great sector but why do they have different rules to the rest of us? And, and this is a, a very interesting point uh, that I want to try and make tonight. I mean, we've got all of the private uh, aviators in the country actually have access to three different licence types. You know, the, the RPC with RALs, which is a, a pilot certificate, not recognised anywhere else in the world. Uh, then you can move on to an RPL, which is some half halfway house between an, an RPC and a PPL. Uh, and then, of course, the, the old PPL, private pilot's licence. Now, I put it to, the, to, to you and all the audience uh, out there watching tonight, what is the difference with, between all of these acronyms? Doesn't private pilot licence actually sum up what we're doing? A private citizen flying a flying machine privately within the skies of Australia? I mean, why do we need all these different licences? Why do we need it to be controlled by different groups? Why isn't it just one licence, one registration, all controlled by the government? I mean, it's not like CASA doesn't get a lot of money to do this job. 
I mean, three hundred okay. million dollars a year. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to jump in here because I'm going to come back to this. We're going to try and break it down so that we can we can I guess understand a bit of the dynamic here. But it's a great moment for me to throw this across to Peter. Uh, Peter, I'd probably like to start by saying. Um, Number one, I've outlined that you're you're soon departing the uh, the gliding federation, and I think that that's uh, obviously great news for you because you're now able to step back and have a bit of retirement from the 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 pace and the fury of being at the front of a of an industry group trying to lead it through some fairly complex uh, regulatory changes or regulation changes. Um, but you know, we've worked together over the past couple of years. Uh, to try and bring, I, I guess, bring the associations together. Um, and that started off uh, a couple of years ago with, I, I guess, an understanding that your organisation and our organisation didn't necessarily see eye to eye. Yep, that, that's right, Ben. We there For a long, long time, AOPA and GFA have been at loggerheads over all sorts of things. But that's... That doesn't need to happen. And I think what we've done recently in the last couple of years has is absolutely worthwhile. Now, I'd, I'd like to say thank you, AAPA, for allowing me to come and talk here. But um, we started working with AAPA as part of the Australian General Aviation Alliance at the Wagga, Wagga meeting where we had we, – we presented at the end a unified approach from all of the people in – uh, in aviation, or 96 groups of them in aviation. And I thought that was absolutely fantastic and we need to keep that going. And as such, um, if I just, I'm, I'm a member of RAOs and I think RAOs is doing a great job in in gathering people and bringing them to aviation and we should recognise that. And we're not out here to bombard anybody. We're all on the same side. We need to get everybody together to make us, to stand together because... Unless we're together, we're done, you know, because we have too many bureaucrats, too many people who just want to separate us, and that's what they want to do. They don't want us working together, and we need to work together because aviation is too important to be let let die. Look, you're absolutely right, and I think it is an opportunity. I know um, we are going to discuss some stuff here tonight, uh, especially around the concepts of self-administration and how that will impact on sport aviation going forward, but I you know, I, I think it is important that we make the comment that because we are talking about this issue and we're trying to discuss facts, uh, for viewers not to misinterpret what we're saying and somehow, uh, I guess, jump on it as if we're, we're here purely to have a sledge or we're, we're having a shot. It's not the case. We're here, to, we're here to have a conversation about how we see sport aviation moving forward. And part of that conversation is to seek to try and understand how some of these regulatory positions are impacting on the industry and whether these positions in the long run are in the national interest uh, and will serve the aviation industry. So I, I think it is really, really important we recognise that there will be some in the industry that find it difficult to have that conversation, um, but I would try to encourage everyone to look at this simply as it is. It's a conversation about facts, uh, and I would welcome if there are those within the community that feel passionate about these issues, uh, put your questions here in the comments and we'll try and deal with those tonight. Um, Peter, obviously at the centre of a lot of the work that we have done over the last two years, uh, Pilot Medicals uh, has featured at the top of it. And I know Tony has straight off the bat tonight, he's gone straight in on the Pilot Medical side. So we're going to try and deal with this one and we'll get it out of the way. But but there really is, I think in the broader, the broader sense, a lot of my travel right throughout the aviation industry, I've, I've listened to pilots from all sides of this camp, whether it be the recreational side, the private side, and even the commercial side, uh, and many from the gliding community as well, Peter. Um, everyone generally understands that for private sport aviation, and I mean, I'd probably give the GFA credit for being one thing that just about every other organisation isn't, and that is GFA is most certainly a sport aviation in that I see glider pilots physically use their gliding to compete. They actually go out and compete in sports, they compete in events, uh, and they're participating in something which very much defines it as sport. Um, but sport aviation on the whole um, has demonstrated across the last 20, 30 years that we actually don't have a problem in Australia of pilots uh, 
I guess, becoming incapacitated in aircraft and either getting themselves killed or getting others killed. It's On the whole, it's demonstrated to have been a very safe uh, sector for self-certification medicals. Do you also see that? Absolutely. We, we have self-certification medicals and uh, I happen to hold the Class 2 medical for other reasons, but um, we have self-certification provided you're not instructing people or flying passengers and they have uh, other requirements placed on them by us. But we, we have self-certification. We think it's only reasonable that everybody who flies, who's reasonable to fly and, and capable of flying, should be able to self-certify. Now, we, we have no history. We've been around since 1949. That's a lot of years. And we haven't got a history of people falling over or, or, or not being able to, to fly their aircraft because they they become incapacitated. It just doesn't seem to happen. I'll, I'll jump in here, um, uh, Peter. David Pilkington, who's one of our AOPA uh, editorial contributors, has just rightfully posted through and said, aerobatic pilots compete as a sport too. And David, you are absolutely right, and they do deserve a mention now. Our sport aerobatic uh, community is a huge contribution to the overall um, uh, diversity of general aviation. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right on that. Um, Peter, we've had this conversation before, but for obviously our viewers, I would ask the question again. And Tony, I would ask the, I'll ask you the same question after this. And that is, uh, obviously you've been around, Pete, since 1949 in gliding. Uh, Self-certification medicals are just part of that matrix that make sport aviation accessible. If we were to remove that, that self-certification medical standard and your community were exposed to the difficulties of the CASA AVMED system in navigating a class two medical, what do you think would be the impact on your particular uh, sports sector? It'd be huge, absolutely huge. We, we would have a large number of those pilots who just go flying for fun and they might compete, they might have a bit of fun here or there or do other things. They might do aerobatics even, but they, they do it by themselves and they have to be responsible for nobody else and they're happy to do it. They would, they would take it, we would take a huge hit. I suspect we'd lose five or 600 pilots just in, in one why, second. Why would, yeah. that be? Why, would, why would that be? Well, quite simply, the, the AV medical um, system is, is designed to, to weed out people and make you not want to fly. You know, it's just so onerous. That's, Let's look at what you've got to do. You've got to go to a special doctor, not your own doctor who might know a little bit more about what you're doing, but you have to go to a special doctor who has, yes, I admit they know a fair bit about certain things, and then you have to go, you have to apply and pay for it, pay for it first now, I believe. Yeah, well, that is right. Um, and then you've got to go through the whole rigmarole, and if there's something, if you hiccuped at the wrong place or you couldn't stand on your foot quite because there was a wind blowing or whatever, you, you have to work out why that is. And it's just so onerous. Tony, obviously the Sport Aircraft Association in dealing with uh, powered uh, aircraft, pilots who hold um, RPLs and PPLs, you are exposed to this environment of class two medicals. I mean, what kind of impact is the class two system having on sport aviation from your organization's perspective? Um, ben, I think it's having a, a very, very detrimental effect. Uh, you know, we, we, we lose pilots uh, and members every year uh, on the basis that uh, they can't get through a Class 2 medical or they don't think they're going to get through a Class 2 medical, Class 2 basic. Um, and they, um, they can literally go down the road and uh, just self-certify with RAOs and continue flying. So, what what the government has set up through through their their situation uh, of uh, the way they deal with these unregisterable aeroplanes, and I'm going to keep using that word, uh, is is they're pushing people into a private company uh, because they don't want to deal with them, and they're using they're using medical uh, as a lever to do it, uh, and they're using economic reform as the as the primary tool. Uh, to construct our regulations. Now, that's not what a regulator should be doing. A, a regulator should be looking at the landscape, should be effectively going, what's 
what's the minimum safety standard in aviation that, that we as a country are prepared to adopt? And then let's make that standard available to everyone. As, as Peter uh, said, uh, the Gliding Federation is an absolute standout performer of VH registered aircraft on self-certified uh, medical. So why doesn't that standard rattle through uh, to, to the rest of us who are flying VH aeroplanes, but they just happen to have a motor in them? Uh, it, just, it just defies logic, it defies common sense. And the only, the only solution you can come up with is it's CASA's economic tool uh, to force people into a self-certified, uh, uh, sorry, self-regulation area. Um, the, the, the buzzword is uh, ASEO, approves uh, self-administration organisation, um, because CASA don't want to do the job that they're, that they're paid to do as, as I'm, our regulator. Tony, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep jumping in because I'm going to be cognizant of that we're on limited time, so I'm going to try and get to as many of these topics that I can tonight, but I just want to drill a little bit further on this uh, pilot medical issue. Uh, obviously, CASA's primary function is to provide safety regulation or regulation to maintain safety for the Australian aviation industry. That's what it's there to do. It's, a, it's an authority that's there to provide a framework that allows the safe conduct of aviation and protects its participants. The fact that, uh, that, the fact that CASA uh, have allowed a self-certification medical standard, not only for RAOs, but they allow it for the gliding and they allow it for other organisations. Do you believe that they have very clearly communicated that this is a standard that they consider to be safe? Well, look, I, I don't see how you can assess it in any other way. Uh, I mean, uh, the gliding federations had self-cert medicals for 70 years, uh, RAOs for 18 to 20 years. Uh, there's other uh, organisations out there, the gyro, copters and, and the like. Um, and that's, that was the essence of my comment previously, is, is if, if the regulator can accept that, a, uh, that this is a happy and safe environment uh, to fly aeroplanes in on, for, a, for a private person, then why isn't that standard rattled out to, to the rest of us. Um, you know, look, I clearly understand that in the hire and reward world, and I, I, I did hold a CPL at one stage, that a commercial pilot needs to be held to a higher standard. Uh, you know, and the airlines are held to a higher standard. We're not arguing that. We're talking about private pilots who fly for fun, who do it for a recreation. Yeah, and, and as I said right from the get-go, what's the difference between all the different labels? Doesn't PPL just sound it all out? Private pilot licence? Isn't it? Well, Tony, there'll be those... Uh, I'll play the devil advocate here. There'll be those on the RAOs side of the system. And again, I'm not using RAOs to pick on RAOs. I'm simply using RAOs because that's where we have a very vocal uh, group right now. Um, that group would, would loudly proclaim that this is simply the general aviation industry being jealous and that it's the general aviation industry seeking to simply peer over the fence uh, with the argument that we want some of what they've got. I mean, is that the case? Is this, you know, is the desire of the sport uh, sport communities to have access to an equal medical standard and act of jealousy, or is this about something other? Well, look, you know, cer certainly you can use the word jealousy, and, and may may maybe it is jealous jealousy, but, but the reality is simply this. Um, you know, the guys at RAOs, and you know, I know many of them, uh, you know, they want more freedoms as well. You know, they want to fly heavier aeroplanes and uh, there's, there's been a, a big movement uh, uh, for them to fly heavier aeroplanes. I mean, the, the issue simply here is, if we're just going back to medical, is medical is summed up beautifully in, in a Part 61 uh, Section 385, I think it is, in, in our licence. Each pilot makes the assessment every day that they go to the aeroplane to get in it, whether they're fit to fly. Now, fitness means, you know, I don't have a cold, you know, I'm feeling happy and healthy, you know, I'm not going to fall over and not be able to do my duties. Yeah, you know, that should be the end of it. That's what's accepted at the RAOs level and, and some of the other uh, groups like, like the GFA. You make that decision. 
you self certify that you you know if you can drive a motor car therefore you you're happy 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 and safe to hurtle down the freeway at 100 kilometers an hour so therefore you can fly an airplane yeah and i feel a bit uh, bad for our rios people who want to get into the heavier airplanes but you know at the end of the day what we're talking about here is medicals and everything else that we're talking about is training now whether you whether you fly a heavier airplane or a lighter airplane that's all about training whether you fly in different classes of airspace that's a training issue whether you fly at night time whether you do aerobatics it's all a training issue and and you know, at the end of the day once the pilot's been trained it should be irrelevant uh, you know what what uh, you belong to whether you belong to to uh, you know one system or the other there should be just one system one set of rules I mean the physics doesn't change you know, on flight just because I'm in an RAOS airplane today at 600 kilos doesn't mean that it's any different you know in a, in a, a Vans RV9 which has also been flown around on RAOS rules but this one happens to be registered as a VH, it's no different whatsoever. In, in fact, uh, um, yeah, it's really sad that our regulator and our government people don't understand that there should just be one standard. Yeah, you're either fit to fly or not. It's a black and white question as far as medical goes. We don't need all these crazy standards and we don't need these standards interwoven with the flight rules that you're going to fly. That's a nonsense. Then we just cross, need a training regime. I'll cross back to Peter here. I can see Peter's intently listening in on this. Peter, one standard for all industry bodies. Would it simplify uh, things? Would it make it easier for the industry bodies if there were a national self-certification standard to which all industry bodies could simply uh, comply? Of course it would. It's, it's crazy to think otherwise. But if, if the push goes towards telling CASA to, to, to make one industry standard, what do we think is going to happen? Uh, the, the, my amount of trust in CASA coming out with a reasonable outcome would see not a self-certification system. I see something closer to a, a CPL medical, I guess, whatever that happens to be, but it's certainly higher than a class two because that would be the only way to ensure that pilots are okay under CASA's normal regime. So I worry about the words one one type of medical system because I believe CASA sees it quite and would see it quite differently to what we see it. We see it as a self-certification. They see it as another pile of bureaucracy uh, to build up. Peter, is that the problem is? I mean, from your perspective, you bring up the, this issue, which is you... You advocate for one thing from CASA. You go in and ask for a horse, they deliver you a camel at best. Do you believe that the, the process uh, is disadvantaged from the get-go by way of, a, I guess, a historical understanding of what CASA seems to have done to regulatory changes over the years? Well, yeah, I think I think that's true. I don't think if you talk to 100 pilots, you would get perhaps one that would say they trust CASA and, and that that person would be called deluded by everybody else. I don't think anybody trusts CASA these days. Uh, and that, and there's good reason for that. Um, and, and it's sad. They've got a lot of really good people in there and some of them are actually trying to do the right thing, but they seem to be bogged down by, by the bureaucratic nature of public service rules, financial rules, government rules, all of them tied in and none of them are aimed at being the best for the for the aviation sector, and that really worries me. Long term, it's going to kill us. Peter, you've made the comment that you believe that one uh, medical system, a, a nationwide self-certification standard that all organisations and industry has access to would benefit the industry and would make things easier. Um, why do you feel it, it is that CASA haven't introduced such a standard? Why do we see CASA allowing certain organisations to use a standard whilst denying uh, other organisations access to that same medical uh, medical level? Well, I think I think it's fairly clear with GFA. We've been around from, from year one and uh, from 1949 and, and we've proven we started off with that and we've fought it time and time again. I remember, it doesn't matter, I won't tell you that story, but I've had some fights with them 
in previous instances when I was in charge of gliding operations. But um, we've proven that safety isn't uh, devolved by, isn't enhanced by making people do certified medicals. We've proven it. We have history on it. Simple as that. Uh, CASA basically, uh, like many other regulators and authorities that exist within the Australian government system, um, are uh, provided a framework, a regulator framework by which they operate um, effectively for, I guess, the layman is it's a, a set of key performance indicators or criteria to which uh, the government, uh, I guess, can judge the performance of a regulator and the top of that list is, in fact, this following indicator, which it says that regulators do not unnecessarily impede the efficient oper operation of the regulated industries. Uh, on this one example alone with pilot medicals, is CASA providing a system in which it is not unnecessarily impeding the functions and the accessibility and growth of sport aviation? And Tony, I might start with you on this one. Well, um, Ben, I think I think they are impeding. Uh, aviation in, in Australia. Um, I, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to have ever tied up the medical condition of a pilot uh, to various flight rules, various uh, uh, functions, uh, the weight of aircraft particularly. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's not common sense uh, to, to, to have those two things together. Um, yeah, medical is medical. Now, whether whether we can trust CASA or or, or not, uh, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be down to that. I mean, our polys should be in there pushing for a set of standards. Um, yeah, and 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 CASA should be carrying them out. Unfortunately, over the life of CASA uh, and the various administrations, CASA seems to have developed this you know, culture within itself that it's not accountable to anybody uh, and, and, and least of all our politicians and, and the people that it governs. And, and CASA continually gets away with this notion that, you know, we're doing a good job with the airlines, um, so, you know, we must be good at our job. But they've done a dreadful job with general aviation. Uh, and, and, you know, our sector in general aviation is going backwards and, and it's been going backwards since the 90s. Um, you know, you've only got to look at the, the sale of aviation fuel um, to, to see that it's going backwards. Uh, yes, I know that there's people that will jump on the fact that, you know, that's been replaced by MoGas, uh, but MoGas has been around for a long time as well. So. Um, generally speaking, all the indicators show us going backwards. And, and I've travelled the country extensively uh, flying around in my own plane. And the number of certified aeroplanes, old Cessnas, Pipers, they've all got CFRs, but they haven't got a maintenance release. They probably haven't had a maintenance release for donkey's years. They're just pushed in the back of sheds. They're left you know, out on the flat on an airfield. I mean, one interesting stat would be for CASA to fess up and just tell the world how many maintenance releases are out there. Not how many are on the register, not, not how many aeroplanes are on the register, but just how many current maintenance releases are there. And, and um, you know, they can get that data very easily. But the, Well, know, Tony, you and I both share a common interest on that. And for the, the last three years at just about every Senate inquiry that I have sat before, and uh, Peter, you've sat in those inquiries with me, and yeah. Tony, you've sat in those inquiries with me. Uh, I've made a point of pointing out that uh, this is, in fact, the most important key performance metric that CASA needs to publish, uh, and it really needs to be made available because there are a couple of there are a couple of really poignant facts that get tied up with this one piece of data, and that is, in order to state whether the Australian aviation system is safer under the current regulations, what we need to understand is what the accident rate is relevant to the number of airworthy of aircraft uh, that we have in the system. And if the number of airworthy aircraft have, has actually been in, has been in considerable decline year on year on year, but the number of accidents have remained the same, then we don't actually have a stable accident rate, do we? We have an accident rate that actually needs to be measured against the number of participating uh, uh, air, aircraft. So, I mean, it's, unfortunately, it's a little bit of a side issue from sport aviation, but it is definitely one that I want to be speaking more about in the upcoming 
uh, general aviation inquiry, which I'm not sure whether you gentlemen have heard, but there was news today that the inquiry may start its public hearings on the 28th of August, uh, and those hearings will go on for a period of time, and it'll be critical that industry comes forward uh, and is able to participate in that to highlight some of these problems. The issue of medicals um, in the sport and recreational sector and its overlap within the private uh, side of uh, general aviation uh, is no doubt a really key piece of reform that needs to be achieved. Uh, and at the moment, CASA appears to have packaged up the ability to provide reformed medicals uh, into somehow being part of this Part 149 self-administration. And Tony, you and I have both sat in meetings where we've been told directly, if you want to be able to provide those medicals to the industry, you need to go and become a self-administration to deliver it. I mean, is that not a lie? Well, it, 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 it is really uh, uh, a lie. I mean, um, just look at the GFA as an example. They don't, they don't have self-administration to uh, an approved self-administrating certificate to be able to deliver what they're delivering, and they've been doing it for 70 years. So, so why, can't, why can't the rest of us do it uh, without having to be pushed into this new silo effect, um, which... which yeah, you know, quite honestly, is fragmenting the industry. It's something that all of us who have been in the industry for a long time know and understand. It's a CASA strategy to stop us coming together. If they can keep us in silos, we're easier to control. Uh, you know, we won't stick our head up above the parapet, so to speak. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the only thing that's getting bigger is CASA. Uh, if Ken Kinane was on the panel tonight, he'd be able to vouch for the fact that, you know, back in uh, the late 90s, 2000, CASA was, uh, you know, 400 strong. Uh, they're over 800 today. You know, and, and yet uh, our, our general aviation, our private pilot aviation, if I can put it that way, we're going backwards. We're, we're going downhill. And to put that into some sort of perspective, in 1998, when the experimental rules flowed out of uh, the USA to Australia and we, and we had uh, experimental amateur built, uh, the SAAA had a membership of 2,400. Today, today, we're struggling along at about 1,000. Now, you know, we're not a vibrant industry anymore. We're not a vibrant sector. And, and simply because CAS has made it too hard with these old generation rules. And yet we see in other jurisdictions around the globe, they're embracing change. They're getting rid of the, the, uh, the, 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 the gold-lined bureaucracy. Uh, and there's a great paper out of the UK on that where you know you, they, they've cut out all the red tape. And, and the, the reality is even the certified aircraft are being pushed into an experimental uh, arena and people who own those aeroplanes can look after those aeroplanes. They can fly those aeroplanes, uh, you know, quite happily. I and mean, you know, Canada is a great example of that. The US is doing something similar, moving along. Yeah, and even Europe's moving in this direction. But in Australia, what we're very, very good at is allowing our bureaucracies to get bigger and bigger and bigger, more unruly, and then pass off the expense onto all of us and and we're a smaller camel today we we just can't carry as many fleas as we could in 2000 all right we're, we're going to jump into this 149 uh, on my next question but first of all i just want to fire it off to uh, gary who's sitting there very patiently i mean gary i often hear uh this statement um put to me across the recreational sectors and they say ben we just want to fly for fun we don't want to be tied up in all of this debate uh, on what has to be done to get the industry fixed. You know, a lot of them will say to me, I'm 70 years of age. I've got potentially 10 good years of flying ahead of me. I just don't want to get involved in this debate. I just want to fly for fun and enjoy myself. I mean, where, number one, where does this kind of thinking take us? And number two, what is it that we need for sport and sport private and recreational, recreational sport and private pilots? What do we need so that we can just go and have that fun? What are the hurdles? Oh, look, I don't know, but certainly um, it'd be great to see that side of our industry grow. Um, 
uh, I think if we could have some um, relaxed um, rules, again, we look at the medical that's been uh, already spoken about. Um, I just think for uh, private people uh, who want to fly their um, sport aircraft, um, it shouldn't be too onerous as far as um, uh, what hoops they need to jump through. Sure, there has to be standards set uh, in in training and, and airworthiness and everything else. But um, so, Gary, if you've obviously gone difficult. to the trouble and the expense to get yourself a private pilot's license, and you're obviously trained to the highest level of private licensing available in this country, should you then have to pay a private company to enjoy recreational flying, or should you be able to access the same standards? Uh, we should all be able to access the same standard. I'm, I'm not sure I'm good at getting into this debate. I just don't understand why we've got, um, uh, why all aircraft are not VH registered for a start. There are a couple of differences. Um, as Peter alluded to earlier, they operate under an instrument um, and they fly VH registered aeroplanes. Uh, there's plenty of other sports organisations who do fly uh, VH registered aeroplanes under um, some kind of a delegation or exemption as well. And, and Tony alluded to the 9555, which is the LSA type RAOs operation. Um, we're, we're all doing the same thing. We're all, we're all out there enjoying ourselves. Um, so um, the, as far as the SAAA and the experimental amateur built world goes, um, we don't have any instrument we don't have any uh, exemptions or delegations we are treated the same as any um, certified aeroplane owner so do participants within the sport aircraft scene that is the sport and experimental aircraft that largely make up your community are these people wanting to be able to work on their own aircraft oh absolutely and as tony said um, if they build the aeroplane uh, and they do our maintenance procedure course and, and some other training, uh, they can maintain that aeroplane. However, it's, it'd be stupid just to go out there and, and do that if you, if you didn't fully understand what you were doing. Um, so it's not for everybody, um, but it's certainly a, a, a benefit um, for the owner builder of an aeroplane to be able to do that. That certainly touch costs. You obviously. And Sorry, Gary. Uh, Tony, you obviously, as the president, you probably bear the brunt uh, of many of the member communications in this space. And one of the issues I know that we have discussed at length uh, is the fact that under the current regulations, if you were to build an experimental aircraft, keeping in mind here that I think that there's a fairly um, clear and conscious choice that's made by a pilot when they decide to build an experimental aeroplane, they know that they're entering a certain sector of aviation, and that's clear. Um, and then when they build that aircraft, they're able to maintain it. Now, the same can't be said for someone that makes a conscious choice to get involved in sport experimental aviation by buying that aeroplane. So if I go along tomorrow and I buy an RV, I don't have the same privileges as the person who built the aeroplane. Uh, we've discussed that this needs to change and that there needs to be a process by where people who've made the conscious choice to participate in experimental sport aviation can do a course somewhere uh, and can then be given those permissions so that they can do those 100 hours and maintain that aeroplane. Is this something that you believe is holding back the sport aviation community? Uh, ab absolutely, Ben. And uh, you know, we've seen this happen, being developed in other parts of the world. Uh, I mean, we're currently working on our, uh, our maintenance training courses. Um, but, you know, and CAS is, CAS is slowly being dragged to the trough uh, by the rest of the world, but they're really dragging their feet. Um, I, I mean, part 43, the, the new part looking into maintenance and, and controlling our engineers and all the rest of it, looks like it's going to be bastardised into some sort of Australian uh, system, not a straight copy from what's coming out of the uh, FAA, uh, which is what we were told, uh, you know, 20 months ago. Uh, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, yeah, CASA took 20 years to muck around with part 149. And when we finally got it, and, and I know we started to talk on this section, 
when we finally got it, um, it's not it's not anywhere near what it was supposed to be or supposed to do, and so much so that uh, you know after it was introduced and we finally got a moss, uh, which was nothing more than a rewrite of the CAOs. Um, SAAA was told there was no room for us uh, to, to do a part 149 because we, we weren't covered by anything in the MOSS, which is okay. just... Right, Tony, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into this. First of all, I'm going straight over to Peter. Uh, Peter, part 149, I mean, the Gliding Federation of Australia, been around since 1949, uh, certainly not the new kids on the block. What's in it for the GFA to move to part 149? I mean, obviously 20 years in the making for this behemoth. Why exactly and what benefit does it provide the GFA above and beyond the provisions that are already afforded to the gliding community through the core regulation? What is the benefit for your organisation to move into this new regulatory, uh, I guess, swamp? Well, that's, that's, well, that's, a, that's really, a really, really good question really good because, because our board is, is really struggling with that at the moment. Some are struggling, some aren't, I guess, but... Um, we we aren't sure of where we're going to go at this point in time. At the moment, we one of the debating points is if we do nothing, what happens? Well, Cass has said to us you won't be able to change anything. Well, okay, we're pretty well set up as we are, so if we just go ahead. Sorry, sorry Peter, I, you've just got my attention with that. Cass, you've been told that if you don't accept Part 149, you're not going anywhere. What does that mean? Well, that means we won't be able to change things. So, and and the, and there's two things, two aspects of that. Uh, one is that we will have to stay as we are with the current rules and regulations, and we don't see that necessarily as such a bad thing, but we, we clearly want to move on sometimes, and sometimes we find really good safety aspects. And we said to them, so we wouldn't be, if we, we came up with something really safe and something that would be a game changer in the safety realm, would you stop us from doing it? And they said, oh, no, no, we wouldn't actually, but uh, but generally you'd have to comply with where you are now. So that's so, it. So that's Peter, a why, why, why do you think that you were told, I mean, effectively, if I'm hearing this correct, what you're saying is you were basically told you will either take 149 and move or what will make your life difficult. Is that what you're being told? Oh, I wouldn't put it in that in those terms, but what happens is if you don't do 149, in 149, you can re-register every five years. Uh, not in 149, you have to re-register every two years, is my understanding. I could be wrong. Don't quote me. But I just want to press this. Sorry, I'm just, again, you've just got my bit. I'm, I'm struggling to understand this. The requirements that they've said to you if you don't move to Part 149, do those requirements currently apply to your organisation under the current regulation? No. So why... I guess that's a great question. Why are you being threatened that if your organisation does not move forward on 149, that somehow there'll be these new onerous requirements put on you to make your life difficult? Do you not see that as a threat? We see it as an issue, yes. Don't see it as a threat as such because it hasn't been, hasn't come to bear yet, but we'll see where that goes. Peter, I'll come back to you. Tony, is the SAAA in your negotiations, has this paradigm being put to you as well? Well, uh, we were actually told we just, uh, we no longer fitted part 149 because we didn't do anything for CASA, so see you later. And yet that's not what the legislation says. Uh, the legislation says that any Australian's entitled to uh, take up a part 149. Uh, and there's many things that we could do uh, that CASA does very poorly in our space. Um, for whatever reason, they don't have the manpower, they, they don't uh, apply the resources, blah, 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 blah. Things that we currently do now, which, which promote uh, a safer world for, for our people uh, to conduct their, their affairs in, you know, to build their aeroplanes and, uh, and fly them uh, more, more safely. So, you know, so, so Tony, what, what, is it, what is it today, what is it today under core regulation that you are doing that under Part 149 you can either do better or more efficiently or more cost effective? Probably nothing uh, in, in some respects, although we could make application to do more under a Part 149. 
but a lot of that application to do more uh, is 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 literally more about the business of trying to survive and uh, work with the existing rules which have got this incredibly unlevel playing field. If if simple things like the medical question was resolved, if if simple issues like follow some of our other bigger partners like Canada and the US was done to bring uh, certified aeroplane into the aeroplanes, you know, old Cessnas and Pipers and the like into the experimental world so those owners could do their own maintenance once they've done proficiency training courses, then, you know, we would see uh, a levelling of the playing field. We would see, you know, literally uh, a growth in experimental. But, you know, 149, I don't think is necessarily going to be the tool that gets us, gets us there unless we have to keep butting heads with CASA. If Tony, we don't, we don't see this type of self-administration in any leading aviation nation around the world. We see leading aviation nations having a centralised and uniform regulatory system that provides all participants with a accessible ramping pathway. That is, you start at the bottom end of the system and you seamlessly work your way through until you you know you, you start flying a bloody hot air balloon and you finish flying a 747. I mean. What makes the Australian aviation industry so significantly different that we require a system of privatising every single sector of the sport community into its own corporate monopoly that requires participants to pay membership fees to every single organisation to have a right of access to aviation? I mean, I just don't understand this, do you? No, I don't, I don't understand it. Uh, I, I think... Uh... It's a, it's, it's just a, a mechanism for bureaucrats to build a bigger bureaucracy, and not have the responsibility of carrying out that job, uh, of, of actually looking after the sector. Uh, I mean, when was the last time anybody was ramp checked? Uh, you know, we don't see CASA officers out there doing what they used to do in keeping the industry safe. I mean, I mean, I've been flying around uh, all over Australia. For, for at least the last 20 years, never, ever have I ever been ramp checked. You know, and I mean... I don't know if I necessarily want to be advocating for anyone to be ramp checked there, uh, Tony, so I, I prefer uh, not it's, to it's tie not... myself to that particular comment. But to, to come back to this issue of Part 149, and obviously, um, you, you know, where we are heading is we're heading towards an industry in which pilots will face the prospect of having to pay to be paid up members. If you, if you for example, if you own a... Um, if you own a Warbird, if you own a, a general aviation aeroplane and potentially have an RV, or, or let's make it a bit more simplified, a tech dam that's on the recreational register, you're going to have to have a private pilot's licence to fly the Warbird, but you could, you could get away if you had an RPC to fly in RAOs. Either way, you're going to have to have a Class 2 basic at a minimum to fly your Warbird, but you but you're then also going to need, I mean, it gets to a point of how many standards, how many how many licences, how many memberships, how many different sets of rules, how many manuals of standards does one industry need for its pilot community and aircraft ownership community to operate in a harmonised and efficient manner? I mean, is, you know, is, some, is the regulator honestly arguing that it will make the aviation industry more efficient if it makes it a hell of a lot more complicated? Well, I, that's that's their argument, uh, mo most definitely. But I, I can't see how that can work in a country uh, with a population of 25 million people and there's, what, 36,000 aviators uh, in, in, in Australia. Uh, I mean, the system that CAS is proposing, it wouldn't work in America uh, with 700,000 pilots uh, in the EAA. So... It's just, it's just nuts uh, where, where we're going to try and silo, maintain uh, the industry into its different groups and, and put all these different licences in. I, I, I think we're actually, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to have, a, as a country, we're going to have a please explain from the rest of the world and certainly the ACAO countries as to what we're doing. And, and just to try and put some focus on that, um, South Africa, uh, our, our near neighbour to the west, uh, they disbanded their 
uh, equivalent of RALs because it didn't work. Now, yeah, it's probably uh, a similar sort of size, may, maybe even smaller than, than Australia. And this system didn't work. I mean, you've seen the correspondence. Uh, I've got a copy of it uh, where the, where the uh, South African CAA uh, issued it, I think it was in March of uh, uh, last year, where, where it was finally uh, disbanded after a three-year notice period. Now, it's sad that that group didn't go back to being a club yeah, you know, and it fell apart. But uh, you know, we should be learning from things that fail, not trying to keep ramming them through in this country. Um, yeah, and I mean, we're we're too small a too small a group of aviators to have stupid sets of rules uh, and 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 dismembering our industry. I mean, I mean, how do we how do we explain the difference in flight training rules? Yeah, you know, what what is the difference? Can, can, if someone could tell me what the physics is that's different between flying a Technam that's registered in RAOs and a Technam that's registered in VH, you know, I'd love to know. And and why why do I have to have a class two or class two basic to fly the VH Technam, but I can go and get myself cert uh, with RAOs and end up with a uh, an RPC uh, flying with RAOs, but I can do a PPL in in the same machine. Yeah, and and why would why would it cost as much as it does to do do it in one machine versus the other? Yeah, and and it's it. Yeah, I use the Technagon example because a friend of mine had two of them. Uh, his, the school that he had was an RAO school as well as a a, a, a part one forty one school and when i when i uh, went to to shift the airplane for him down to an open day that we were having uh, well, in fact it was the fly into to langley park and i i said i'd relocate his airplane to serpentine airfield for him he said oh make sure you get in the one with the vh on the tail because uh, uh the other blue ones uh, the, the next serial number but it's registered with raos and he said you're not allowed to fly that and it's like Really? You know, I've got a CPL license. Yeah, I've, I've flown I've flown twins up to night rating, and yet I'm not allowed to, under the Act, to get into an RAOs aeroplane because I'm not qualified to fly it. Well, I'm, look, Tony, you raise a very you, you raise a very interesting uh, discussion on that one point, and I think that it is a discussion that, frankly, deserves to be thrashed out thoroughly by some firm aviation lawyers because the truth of the situation is that CASA have designed an exemption and an exemption has been put in place that says that an RAO's registered aircraft is an Australian registered aeroplane. That's the only way in which that RAO's registered aircraft is permitted to fly in Australian airspace is it must be defined by law as an Australian registered air aircraft. Otherwise, it does not comply with the law that allows it to fly in the airspace over the top of this country. And your flight crew licence, when you hold a PPL or an RPL, states you can fly a Australian registered aircraft. And so I, I think it has been a, a, a furphy that's been thrust on this industry that says you have to somehow pay a private company for the ability to fly that registered aeroplane. And I know that I know they're doing it. And I know CASA and RALs have worked together on it. But I think that if it were really tested in the courts, it would probably fall apart and that would be a realisation that you actually really have a right once you're licensed by CASA that if it is regarded as an Australian registered aeroplane, you can fly it. And I know there are those within the, the recreational community that will espouse that you need to be covered by their insurance well, that's what aircraft insurance policies are for. Uh, they're designed to cover you for those exact reasons. So that, that is a debate that I think that should be had and we should be speaking more about that to get to the bottom of whether the industry has, in fact, had its rights abused in respect of that. To come back to you, um, uh, Peter, Part 149, obviously your, your reaction is to say, I don't know what it will do for the GFA that we're not already doing right now. You've said that CASA have told you you either move to this system or if you refuse to to move forward, things are going to get very complicated or very difficult. 
What's it going to cost the GFA? I mean, obviously, to move to this system of regulatory management, this 149 is going to have a direct financial impact on the ability of GFA to operate. Can that be quantified? Well, the, when the Deputy Prime Minister uh, brought out the wording of 149 and when he brought it into legislation, he mentioned in part of his preamble that it would cost about $150,000 for a medium-sized organisation. And he clearly didn't think that was any impost at all. That's just to get into it. And that's about changing all the documentation to meet the new regs. Well, in GFA's case, we don't want to waste $150,000. And we have, a, in fact, asked if CASA can help us with that, and we haven't got an answer on that. But... Uh, so $150,000 just to go into it to change all your regs around to something that now suits something else. That doesn't pass the sniff test to me, and that's a real worry. And then there's probably 50000 every year, they said, uh, to to maintain your system in there. So that's... So, Peter, obviously it's easy for CASA to dream up these, I'll call them a regulatory nightmare, because I really do believe it is a regulatory nightmare for those that are being subjected to it. And I think in fairness, I've been reasonably vocal in trying to express to the broader industry that Part 149 is not the sweetheart darling that everyone thinks it is. And that if you do start to look beneath the bonnet, you start to see that the, the Ferrari is in fact not a Ferrari. It's more like a Holden Camira that's got a body kit on it, <laughs> rotten to the core. Uh, it's going to expose GFA to some pretty significant costs. It, it also will expose the organisation to some pretty broad liability as well. Is that correct? Uh, there, there's direct liability through through some things, yes. There's, but I, I don't see it's any different or not a lot different to where we currently are. We still have we currently have quite a lot of liability associated with things. Um, this directs more of it, I guess, but we'll, we'll see. We have to look further at before we go any further. So for a community group that's really focused on trying to promote the sport uh, and to look after its members, this is going to uh, obviously increase the cost of operation, increase uh, in, a, in a myriad of ways your liability exposure. I mean, you know, is this really what the members uh, of the gliding community and is this really what the pilot participants and aircraft owners of the broader industry want? Is it that we want more cost, more complexity, or do we want the opposite? Well, we don't want more cost or more complexity. We've been trying very hard over the last specifically four or five years to minimise complexity and to minimise cost. You know, that's they're, they're hideous factors that, that slow down and put barriers in front of pilots. We need to stop, take those barriers away if we can. Tony, obviously, Sport Aircraft Association has been told that there's no pathway forward uh, for your organisation, uh, but that of that information and that position only came about in the past 12 months. Prior to that, your organisation was being dragged to the Part 149 table and CASA were fairly determined to see to it that the SAAA were part of that mix. Is that correct? Uh, that is basically correct, uh, Ben. It was about, about 18 months ago, I think, we got the letter saying uh, uh, there's nothing uh, in it for us, so uh, CAS is not going to um, you know, continue to deal with us in that space. Uh, effectively, we were told to go away after being involved for nearly 20 years. Um, so is it correct, it, it is... Tony, that that letter, and I'm going to just jump in here, but is it correct also that that letter followed on off the back of the SAAA becoming quite vocal amongst the community in discussing what it saw was the concerns of Part 149. I mean, I seem to remember there was a lot of dialogue uh, going on uh, over the last 12 months, and even I was quite surprised that after such a concerted period of saying that SAAA had to be involved in this, when the SAAA started to get vocal and was demonstrating to the rest of the sports bodies that it was possibly going to take a stand in saying, no, we wouldn't throw our organisation at, at this regulation. All of a sudden you were told, oh, our apologies, sorry, but uh, we can't find a way forward, so we won't be going any further. Is that correct? That, that is exactly correct. Um, in, in fact, uh, all, all of the nine bodies were dragged, I think, on three occasions uh, uh, to Canberra and Sydney to discuss funding. Uh, now, that is a pool of funding that CASA gives out to the sports bodies to 
carry out safety tasks. Um, and uh, CASA had done a, their own analysis, which was going to result in a total redistribution of that fixed sum of money uh, to, to the organisations. And this was all a precursor uh, in how they evaluated the organisations and who was going to be lined up to get 149 first and blah, 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 blah. Um, and uh, in both the GFA's case and our case, we lost significant funding uh, in favour of, of, the, of some other organisations. But the interesting part of those discussions was that eight out of nine groups all managed to sit in a room and thrash out the different details and problems of how they were going to work together, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think after that actually happened and uh, we ended up writing a collective letter uh, and, and Peter, you were the author of that letter on behalf of everybody, um, you know, we were able to, to tell Casser and Mr Carmody, uh, you know, how we thought it needed to go. But in that process, uh, you know, effectively CASA finally came through with their part 149 and their MOS and it was different to what we were all led to believe just marginally but it, it shifted the goalposts and there was no degree of funding to take people there uh, each organization was expected as Peter's already told you to, to at least put up $150,000 and and it was just a nonsense um, and I'll, I'll tell you why it's a nonsense because one of the organizations was the Australian Balloon Federation they've only got 300 members how in God's name were they ever going to have a part 149 and stump up hundred and fifty thousand dollars or thereabouts it wouldn't have mattered if it was fifty thousand dollars they couldn't afford it so it just made it quite stupid the way in which 149 had finally been cast that these sporting organizations were going to have to come up and fund all of this massive bureaucracy and and it, and, and from our case this, the SAAA you know we started asking the hard questions and, and we asked them to the group you know if if CASA can't come up with a way of funding everybody through to this new set of regulations then wouldn't we be more collectively stronger if we just said, no, none of us are going to do it? And, um, um, and that almost got up as a concept. But in the process, um, you know, SAAA got sledged. Well, I, at the request of the SAAA, I attended uh, one particular meeting uh, at CASA uh, in which the Part 149 system was being discussed. And I think Chris Monaghan and Jonathan Alec were at that meeting. Uh, and I have to say that it was a thoroughly enlightening experience to watch the con job that was being done on the Australian aviation industry by CASA at the time, uh, in that they were being butted up and smooth talked into trying to provide an endorsement for the government because you could see at the time, I think it was, um, I think it was either, I think it was Darren Chester at the time, they really wanted to get an announcement out for Minister Chester that the industry had signed off on part 149. And I think at that meeting, Tony, if I remember correctly, you weren't able to attend. Peter, were you at that meeting? I think you might have been at that meeting, but anyway, at that particular meeting, I was asked for an opinion on it all, and I, I warned the sports aviation groups and said to them all, um, it would really behoove the sports groups not to sign off on this and to sort out the sport funding uh, prior to moving any further forward, because it appears that what CAS is dressing you up for is to try and encourage you all to sign off on Part 149 with no commitment from the government on how it intends on funding part 149 for the industry uh, and if you do sign off on it now you're going to come back later on and you're going to find out that the funding's gone and you've already signed it off and well as history sometimes proves us to be tragically accurate uh, it was only a matter of months before CASA then pulled the pin on the funding and the sport groups were left sitting around the table desperately trying to come up with a way uh, to dish out and allocate the money that CASA were prepared to give everyone and I think the importance of saying this and letting people know 
but this is the type of behaviour that goes on, is that part 149 is really Cass's baby. It's pushed it on industry. Um, under the standard terms of us as industry doing business with CASA, when you go to them and you ask them to do something, we pay a fee for CASA to perform a function to give us an outcome. Well, in this particular instance, CASA have gone to industry and said, we want you into 149, but they haven't offered to pay. They want us to pay to do something that they want to achieve. And even if we do pay and we trans, uh, sorry, we transform the industry towards this 149, all we are doing is we are committing the industry to increase overheads, increase complexity, and for no genuine service benefit. And so it is a, a frightening prospect that many within the industry leadership are marching to the beat of this drum uh, and not actually looking at what we're doing to the broader industry and the national interest or whether we're improving the situation or making it worse. Peter, the question to you is a really direct and simple question. Um, will part 149 improve the GFA? The answer to that question is I don't know. I don't I don't see that we we will end up being as good initially when it when it was proposed twenty two years ago, it was to give some uh, qualitative measure of control and, and support for your members. And now I'm not not convinced about that but one of the things that it does bring forward is is the the principle of trust and i'd just like to bring it up here uh, those in the or most of those in this in this uh, forum uh, would understand that when we talk about the funding situation the eight out of the nine uh, sports groups went away and we we had we all had our vested interest we wanted to to get our get our money because it was government money and we, we need it to support because largely we put our own people a pay, some of our people are paid to do that, the duties for CASA and that's where it goes. So we, we don't just do that out of the goodness of our heart. And then we were told time and time and time again, there is no more money other than the whatever the 500,000 was to to separate between the groups. So we sat down and we worked it through like, mature adult organisations and some of us didn't like the outcomes but we, we got a, a, a best position out of it and then we presented that to Catherine. and I happened, as Tony said, I wrote the letter on behalf of the group and the group all authorised it and I sent it to CASA and then they suddenly found an extra 20000 for RAOs. Now, we don't mind RAOs getting extra money. It's just that all the way through the... I don't know, it took about seven months for us to go through it. All the way through, we were told there is no extra money, there is no extra money, there is no extra money. So we've asked the question, and so, and so have a number of other organisations, about what, where's the trust? How can we trust somebody who says, or an organisation who says, there is no more money, and then suggests finds it? That just doesn't augur well for the future. Peter, do you believe that CASA deals with GFA in the same equal standing that it deals with RAOs, or do you believe that CASA provide all manner of favours for RAOs where they would not do that for the other bodies? I think RAOs has a better political nous and they are locally locally positioned in Canberra, so they have monthly meetings with CASA on a high level basis, and we don't. So we don't have the money, or and we're based elsewhere. So and Victoria, which at the moment you can't go anywhere. So. Um, I think they get more hearings, but it's, I don't think it's intentional on CASA's behalf. I think it's just they're local. Honestly, I think that's the way it is. They're, they're there. That's a political decision they probably made, and it makes it easier for them to talk to the regulator. If only we could get them involved on the airports front, maybe we could knock off a few more of these privatised airports with that political clout. Wouldn't that be a good that, outcome? That, that would be fantastic, because we need to engage them where we can. There's no doubt Absolutely. about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So sport aviation moving forward, Tony, uh, obviously we need to sort out this pilot medical situation so that more people can participate in sport aviation. Uh, we need to focus on uh, breaking through some of these barriers and getting uh, the engineering regulations set up to support people entering the sport and experimental space and being able to do a short course and be entitled to work on their aircraft and maintain it. 
what other things do we need to see to move sport experimental aviation forward in Australia so more people can enjoy and share it? Um, training. Tra training is the, is the next big uh, area that needs to be standardised. Um, I know that uh, AOPA has been pushing for a long time to have the independent flying instructor. Uh, I absolutely support that. Um, I think since we've lost the independent flying instructor in the bush, uh, that aviation has gone backwards. Um, and simply uh, the, the process in which VH registered flying training is going through part 141 uh, and all of the bureaucracy that's now been pushed onto those schools is just an absolute killer. Um, I mean, I think we've seen something like 1,500 GA schools, the, you know, the independent uh, guys disappear um, from, from the landscape. Uh, certainly, uh, we've seen an influx of uh, RAL schools uh, come along and, and good on them for that, you know, 176 schools and good on those people for doing it. But, you know, when you set up a double standard in flying training, uh, you know, you, you, you disadvantage one sector over the other. And, and for what reason? You, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, before COVID come along, we saw an international pilot shortage. Uh, you know, once upon a time, Australia could supply a lot of pilots uh, from, from its flying schools. Now we've had a unique situation where the big airlines are looking at establishing their own schools because they can't get the feedstock of commercial pilots. You know, and why is that? Well, one simple reason is uh, an RPC won't take you anywhere until you've converted it to a, a PPL and then on to a CPL. Uh, so, so um, whereas uh, if you did a PPL off the bat, uh, you could get the shortened course straight through to CPL in a school. But the 141 school, and I don't profess to be an expert in this arena, but I do have some very good friends who, who are instructors, have been lifelong instructors, and I'm sure Gary can talk to this far more eloquently than I, I can. But I'll tell you a story about... Uh, uh, the CFI of the Royal Aero Club, John Douglas, who spoke to me in a supermarket um, late last year before this COVID thing got going. And I said, oh, John, I'm, I'm hoping to get off to the RAT committee hearing shortly, uh, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, God, he said, I wish you every success. He said, I don't think we'll have a GA industry in modern years. Now, that's a guy who spent his entire life from a young man to, and I guess John's in his uh, well in his 60s now uh, and the twilight of his years and he is so feeling beaten up by the government and CASA and what's going on in flying schools that he doesn't think we're going to have a future in five years in this country. I mean, that's that was depressing to me because, you know, John's someone I look up to. You know, he's, he's always been around in the West Australian flying scene if you had a problem you could go to john and he'd sort you out uh or you could send you could send uh, uh as i did sent my son there to learn to fly uh you know when he was a youngster um it, it's just depressing that casa have come up with a 141 program that's just killing our industry and just to put the final touches on that and, and um i'll ask gary to speak to it a bit more you know, we wanted to, as an organisation, do our uh, AFRs. The, uh, the gliding club do their AFRs. So why wouldn't we be allowed to, with the, 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 the people that we have in our organisation, do an AFR in the sports experimental aeroplane that the owner who's licensed to fly it he just needs a senior person sitting next to him to make sure he's up to scratch? Why wouldn't we be allowed to do that? And what we were told is, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. That, that would improve safety. And then it started. Oh, you'll have to have a Part 141 licence. And, and when you start looking into it, I've, and Castle will tell you, oh, that's an easy document. It's just a tick and flick. It's not a tick and flick. The more you get into Part 141, the more you sell your soul to the devil. And uh, it's, just, it's just a drama.
So yeah, we're still nice, a nice segue there. Uh, nice segue there, just to jump into it, Gary. You and I had uh, some brief discussions today, uh, and you said to me that it, it can be an incredibly frustrating experience in that you are trying to deal with CASA and recognising that there are many very good people inside of CASA, but trying to deal with CASA to sort out these types of issues. Uh, and I think that you called it the Chinese Whisper Network, where suddenly obviously one of these CASA staff members go to someone to get some uh, either supporting advice or um, parallel advice and then it starts, the differing opinions all come into it and before you know it you've now got a chorus of you know, varying people saying varying things giving you varying outcomes. I mean, how do you cope with that? Yeah, well it's yeah. difficult um, and I'm certainly not going to bash CASA. Um, I've had um, some pretty good experiences with CASA. Uh, and as Peter said, there's lots of good people there. There's just not enough of them. Um, it, it's a public service mentality that happens in there. But uh, I'll get to the Chinese whispers thing in a minute. But I'd just like to um, say that we have, the SAAA has um, our general competency flight training program, um, which deals with type transition training and recurrent training. Uh, recognised and approved by CASA. Um, it's very, very simple, four lesson plan. Um, you know, you start with introduction and, and general handling, uh, going to some low speed uh, handling and upset prevention and recovery. Uh, spend a fair bit of time in the circuit and then you move on to um, our various uh, emergency procedures and, and partial uh, power and, and everything else. Now, that's all based on the general competency rule, which is 61.385. That's CASA legal speak as to what you must be able to do, essentially, if you jump in an aeroplane and go flying, or, or if you want to do a flight review. Um, so the flight review, to me, is our next... Um, it just should follow on. The Chinese whisper story... Um, very recently, I've had many phone calls, perhaps over the last two or three months, guys ringing up and saying, oh, I want to do my AFR, or I want to do a PIFR, or I want to do a, a commercial licence upgrade. But the training organisation have said, oh, I don't think we can do it because CASA said we can't. And I said, well, what are they quoting from CASA? And inevitably, it had come back... Um, 262 AP, which is really nothing more than uh, limitations uh, to do with uh, experimental aeroplanes. Now, on those limitations, um, it clearly states that uh, as the owner of the aeroplane, um, you're quite entitled to do all of those things, all of that training. The one that um, broke the camel's back was uh, one of our members rang his instructor that he'd been using for a long time and said, it's time for me to do my AFR. And he said, oh, no, he said, uh, CASA have said I can't do that. So we, we, we found out a why, and that was to do with this CAP Admin 1, which is, which is basically an indemnity uh, policy for all the uh, CASA delegates and examiners. Um, we got, or Tony got in touch with uh, CASA, uh, and, and thank God, um, uh, as I said, there are some good people there, and they got back to us pretty quickly and debunked all of those myths. Um, you can do all of that training as the owner of an experimental aeroplane, uh, upgrades, renewals, whatever you need. There are no restrictions. Our aeroplanes, as far as certification or uh, you know, your 100.5 and, and, and the equipment in the aeroplanes is to the same standard as, as a certified aeroplane. So we've got to get an information paper out to our members and we've also got to get something out to the uh, aviation industry uh, for all the independent guys and the Part 141 people out there to say. Um, and, and I know a couple of people where it came from um, uh, within CASA. And it kind of, obviously, it spread like wildfire because it was unusual. I'd had uh, four phone calls in about two and a half months on, on the same sort of subject. But it's been put to bed. 
And so, Tony, obviously this situation of the varying opinions and today I had a, uh, you know, a fascinating uh, meeting with uh, a team at the Bankstown Airport regarding a, a story that we're going to bring our viewers next week on Tuesday and it is a story like Glenn Buckley's that will just make your toes crawl uh, on how the damage that can be done to the industry and to businesses by having multiple CASA staff involved in issues, each providing their own interpretation uh, of the regulation uh, and, in, and in some cases having a completely incorrect interpretation of the regulation. And as a consequence of that, industry and businesses make decisions based on that information and those decisions can turn up being catastrophic. Uh, and so with this particular example, I mean, trying to navigate the CASA system, I mean, you and I have attended nine of Senate hearings. We've tried to convey to the minister, we've tried to convey to the Senate. Hell, we've even tried to convey to CASA themselves as much as they probably don't want to listen to it, that there appears to be a, a very big problem that across the CASA staffing network, there are those that are either not trained are trained inadequately or lack a, a relevant level of knowledge of the roles that they're, they're performing. And as a consequence, the industry is either getting poor advice, defective advice, or advice that re, that results in, in helping accelerate and drive decline. I mean, what's your view on this? I put it down to over complex rules. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we need to have a partnership with uh, people in CASA and we all need to understand the rules and on both sides of the fence. And it's very, very difficult uh, the way in which the rules are constructed today. Uh, and in this uh, transitionary period where we're now getting the overlap of the, the uh, CASARs uh, as they debunk some of the, the CARs from, uh, 90, uh, from yeah, 1988, um, it's just a complete mess. Uh, you know, I, I, we all know about the mess of Part 61 licensing and the years that it's taken to try and sort out that, that uh, pile of uh, garbage. Um, but every part of CAS is turning into the same mess. Now, you know, if, if you're getting paid by the government and you're a bureaucrat, the bigger the mess, you know, the more secure your job is and you're there, you're there uh, you know, making hay while the sun shines. But everybody else who's trying to navigate their way through this maze is just left totally and utterly bereft at, at, at the nonsense that's going on. And, and you know, what, what I say to, to those out there, uh, senators, if they're listening, government ministers, uh, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for God's sake, just simplify it, you know, get back to the KISS principle. You know, we are a tiny country in the scheme of things. Our aviation industry is tiny compared to, to our G8 neighbours. Just simplify it. I mean, you, sh you should be able to read all the rules you need as a private pilot, yeah, you know, on the back of a phantom comment. <laughs> Unbelievable. Peter, uh, obviously key in this, uh, in moving forward for the industry is, as Tony has said, we need a relationship, a working constructive relationship between industry and regulator. Do you feel CASA have been really listening to industry and do you feel or do you think that they have an understanding of, of the problems or is it that they are continuing to operate i guess in many ways not wanting to know what the problems are with the industry i'm going to do a political answer to that uh, and i apologize for that but it's true um we have some really good people in there and, and some of those people are now at higher levels and they're starting to listen and they really are listening i'm quite confirmed about that um, but there are still far too many that just sit down and they have no skin in the game and that's the problem they have no skin in the game i think tony alluded to it in when he said uh these people in casa don't know what it's all about in in some of his statements but really if they make a mistake they don't get fired. 
they don't get passed over. They might get spoken to and told, don't do it again, slap on the wrist. There is no skin in the game. If there's no skin in the game, what have they got? They make mistakes. They build a bigger bureaucracy. They might even go up a level. How good is that? But we need them to have a skin in the game somewhere. Somewhere they need to be accountable at all levels. I've said it before, if you were to performance link the salary packages of key CASA leadership uh, and decision makers to the growth metrics of the Australian aviation industry, we would go through a six-month period of reform that would look like we've just jumped in this, you know, a Starship Enterprise and entered warp speed. You'd be struggling to hang on with the level of change that suddenly the industry would be thrust to because these people would be there saying, I want that bonus check, baby. <laughs> We're going to fix this industry. It's going to happen overnight because I want that money in the bank. And really that's what it comes down to is it comes down to the simplicity that there is no motivation. There appears to be no motivation whatsoever uh, in driving to that performance outcome. It's just, oh, well, when we get to it, we get to it. So it's a struggle for the industry. Obviously, to raise the profile of these issues, it's been critical over the last three to four years to try and bring these discussions into the public dialogue and to elevate those conversations so that they're heard by the government officials, they're heard by the senators, and they're even heard by CASA. I mean, we've gone through a period, both Tony and uh, Peter, where CASA have sought to, and I think I can say this quite honestly, they've actually sought to exclude many of the industry bodies from direct conversation because they don't like criticism. They do not like criticism, and I can say that quite quite cleanly. I know I've been, I've bought, I've, I guess, borne the brunt of uh, much of their upset because I've dared break the mould and come out publicly and talk about things and just say, let's get it out in the open, let's have a conversation. I mean, if we're going to move forward as an industry, we need to be working together. Um, is it important? Is it important in going forward that we continue to talk about these topics publicly and build a greater awareness of where things are working and where things, more importantly, are not Tony? Um, look, Ben, absolutely. I, I think we've got to keep uh, discussing the, the, the thorny issues. We've got to keep it out there. I mean, the squeaky wheel is, is the one that gets the oil. Um, yeah, I, I certainly don't want to be uh, singling out different organisations because we're all aviators, we're, we're all flyers. I mean, if you've had the guts to get yourself into some sort of flying machine, whether it's a hot air balloon or, or an ultralight or, or a home-built jet, it uh, doesn't matter. You know, you're all aviators, you know, and, 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 and that, that makes you a special band of uh, uh, brothers and sisters. Um, and, you know, we should all be having equal access to, to uh, one set of rules. Um, I've said it, I'll keep saying it. Uh, one medical, one set of rules. We're all just private, private Joes uh, going flying, having fun, you know. And, and if, you know, if you want to spend more money on training to fly something bigger and heavier and that, spend the money. But you shouldn't, you shouldn't be precluded from doing that. You shouldn't have the government... Uh, regulator saying no, you can't do that unless you go here and do that and play and pay a lot more money. That's that's just that's just crazy stuff. Uh, you know, it, you should you should uh, yeah. You know, if you're fit to fly because you can drive a car, you should be able to fly whatever you want to fly, and you should be able to fly whatever rules you want to fly if you've done the training. If your aircraft has got the transponder and got all the radios and it's done the tests. Uh, and it's mechanically serviceable to do that flight rule, uh, set of rules, uh, whether it be flight night, whether it be fly aerobatics, you know, what fly fly class C, who cares? Yeah, you know, it's a training issue. And, and when our politicians finally realise and they and they uh, uh, get it, and I know some of the senators do because they've they've got licences, and we spoke about this in one of the RAT uh, hearings. But why, in God's name, CASA keeps segmenting and fragmenting and mixing all the the, the, the notions up of, of training and medical it's just it's just a, a nonsense it's just a way for them to dismember the industry and boy have they done it well in the last 20 years they've killed GA Peter yep my my view across the board is we need to stand together and that's that's really really important I don't think anybody can understand just how closely We've aligned with AOPA, for example, as opposed to what we were 
20 years ago. We, we were diametrically opposed. And, and it's really important that our AOs, GFA, all of these groups, all the sports groups and all the general aviation groups work together and understand where we're going. Now, we need to be very careful what we wish for. We go in and say we want a common standard of, of aviation medicals. CASA will try and make that common standard something that's so draconian that nobody will ever be allowed to fly. We need to make sure when we say things like that, we say we want a signature medical that we can hand on heart say we're doing this and then work from there. So we need to be careful what we ask for because if we're not, they will dissem di disseminate us and they'll, they'll, they'll kill us. Peter, obviously, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And frankly, I think that the only way that we will meet this challenge uh, head on is to be standing absolutely shoulder to shoulder. And I think it's important as well that we do mention that standing not only with uh, Gliding Federation and Sport Aircraft and AOPA is the AMROBA, so the Aircraft Maintenance Repair Overhaul Business Association, the Sport uh, Aviation Federation of Australia with the the hang gliding. Um, we also have uh, just about all of the type group associations uh, standing with us and a, and a great deal of others. The, the Australian General Aviation Alliance, which is a unity partnership that was formed uh, between AOPA, or should actually technically sport aircraft started this initiative and we entirely hijacked it to drive it at warp pace to get it ready for, these, uh, for the General Aviation Summit. Uh, but this, this coming together of the industry is really around this argument that um, all too often we try to move things forward with CASA and it gets bastardised. And the only way to stop it getting bastardised is that when we all stand together and we're all absolutely on the same page and we're all sitting basically saying this has to be done this way, it becomes very difficult to, uh, I guess, work against us. And we saw that in the last push around the medical reform um, changes uh, that were done back in 2017 when the bulk of the industry bodies were prepared to absolutely get behind the push to say let's get self-certification done but quite upsettingly we had um, we had one organisation RAOs which decided to really advocate to the government that the government should consider that if it gave a self-certification medical to the rest of the industry that it could create a reason whereby pilots would simply choose to stay within the CASA system that wasn't an outcome that they wanted uh, and we're really advocating effectively to the government to say, look, don't do this because we want to keep these pilots as part of our system where we can collect some money from them. Now, I've got some pretty strong views on whether I think that that's an appropriate position to take uh, and I would remind everyone that my, my view on this is one that looks at what's in the national interest. I tend not to look at what's in the interest of GFA or what's in the interest of SAAA or even RAOs. What I look at is I, I look at are we serving the benefit of the industry long term in creating a framework that's affordable and accessible? And I think that we really do need to be standing together on this. If you could sit in the same room as RAOs today uh, on that issue, Peter, what would you say to them? What I've said to them before, and, and I have. I've, I've spoken to Michael Linky and, and said to him, what do your members think of that? And that's the important thing. That's, that's the question that each one of us needs to ask. What do your members think about this? And if you can answer them honestly with hand on your heart and say they would applaud this, that's the answer you should, you should have. Being a sport body, um, Peter, do you believe that the average participant of this industry wants to see simplified medical standards for the whole of industry or do you think that you know the individual sectors simply just want to look after themselves? I think... I think I think CASA and the individual sectors have all worked against each other uh, over a long period of time. And I think they do. I think the general aviation pilot, and I talk to a lot of them. I'm, I'm, a, I'm across a whole pile of sectors. Um, and I talk to a lot of people, and they would all like to see a simplified everything, anything. They don't care. Everything's simply too complicated. And we need to simplify the whole the whole aviation world because that's what's killing us. Yes, simplified medicals are one aspect and we just need to be careful. That's all. Tony, I'll give you the opportunity as well. If you had the opportunity to sit with uh, the RAOs, and I know you and I have done that on numerous occasions, but 
again, after all of the effort of the last three years and knowing that we really need in this, especially in this day and time where things are now becoming very difficult for the broader industry, what would you be saying to the RAL's leadership? Well, um, I, I, I would hope that uh, they would see that a simple set of rules to govern all aviators is in the best interest of all aviators. Uh, and continuing to try and protect at whatever cost uh, 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 an existing monopoly is not for the good of uh, their members or any aviators or, or the good of the country. Uh, and um, I don't know whether that's uh, going to change under the current leadership, maybe uh, with some new people coming onto their board, it, they, it might happen. Uh, but I'm sure that the, the general rank and file out there, most of them just want to be left alone and fly. They don't want complication. Uh, they just want to be left alone and fly. But you know, this is this is where you know CASA needs to stand up. This is where the government needs to stand up and direct CASA to fix it. Uh, you know, we don't need uh, complications. I mean, that it's just crazy. Um, you know, has has, uh, has CASA shrunk its numbers? Since uh, since COVID started, not at all. You know, aviation's down the toilet. Uh, you know, in 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 even the, the jet sector uh, and the RPT and all the rest of it. Has has CASA changed? Not at all. It's just a it's a it's a, a juggernaut bureaucracy, which um, you know effectively it's it's in self protection mode, uh, and it has been for decades. Um, you know, and until there's some accountability uh, and, and, and achieve an outcome, then you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I get very down at, at times because I don't see a way forward uh, unless uh, something changes. Well, gentlemen, it's been a packed uh, one hour and 46 minutes of our lives. Whether we've solved the problems of the aviation industry tonight in this one Facebook Live panel discussion, I'm uncertain. But I think what is clear is that there is a real firm commitment from everyone that we see that the way forward is to be standing together and working together to ensure a strong future for sport aviation. Um, I'm still unconvinced that Part 149 is in fact the future for our industry and I think that it presents far more uh, challenge and problems uh, for the aviation industry than what it could ever generate in benefit. Um, there are situations unfolding right now um, in which we, we are seeing the potential for third parties to litigate self-administrations uh, in what we've seen with BRM Aero, there's a significant sum of money uh, that they've been damaged by and now they are looking fair in the gun sights uh, towards the self-administration of the RAOs for, for potentially $30 million worth of damages claims, which is a staggering figure. And you'd have to ask yourself, um, would that same uh, potential litigation take place if they were looking at suing the Commonwealth? And I, I'd have to say I probably don't think that you would as a company try to sue the Commonwealth because you could spend more than you could probably ever get back. But there are risks associated with where we're heading um, and it's not all rosy days. And I think that um, I know I've spoken directly with um, leadership within the industry and I'm continuing to speak with uh, those on the Senate RRAT and hopefully trying to communicate through the Deputy Prime Minister's office that maybe one of the directions we could be heading uh, in the short term is to actually undertake a review to look at how effective self-administration truly would be for aviation uh, and the Australian industry before we commit the industry bodies to this course of action, which to reverse them from uh, may become incredibly difficult and costly. So still a very challenging uh, future in front of us all, but clearly one we all need to be working together. Peter, uh, I understand that you'll be stepping down uh, shortly from your role with the uh, Gliding Federation. While I've got the opportunity, I, I'd really love to thank you publicly uh, for everything that you have done in partnership with AOPA over the past several years. Whilst our organisations were predating me, uh, whilst the... <laughs> I have to say that, Peter, because if I don't say it, someone's going to say, see, they can't work with that Ben Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, problems that obviously predated my, uh, my time with AOPA, but I'm thoroughly impressed that you and your board uh, and your leadership team have been able to look beyond those historical challenges and to identify that we are all uh, all really pushing towards trying to assure the success of aviation. And so on behalf of all of our members, I thank you for everything that you have done and for the service you've given the GFA and the service you've given the AOPA Australia membership and, of course, our partners through the AGAA. It's been a great uh, amount of assistance to know that uh, even when we're there pushing on things that were not necessarily centric to the gliding community, that you would travel all the way from Adelaide to Canberra to sit with us and to stand with us and to send a very powerful message that that together we're strong. So I really do thank you, man. No problems. We're all on the same side. I echo that. Uh, thanks uh, from from the SAAA, Peter. You know, you've been a, a star ward of the aviation community, uh, and, and thank you uh, so much for your support. Um, and I, if I could just uh, finish very quickly, Ben, uh, for our audience out there, how many organisations have actually achieved Part 149? And it's now been available to us for nearly two years. Um, does anyone know the answer? I do. One. One. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so what, what use is it to us? Well, Tony, again, thank you very much. I know that you put in a huge amount of work as well uh, with the AGAA partnership and you're a huge resource. And Gary, thank you for stepping into the shoes tonight to fill in for John, who unfortunately uh, was not available uh, to participate. So thank you both. Thank you. No worries, Ben. And well done. Okay, man. and that concludes our latest Facebook Live panel discussion. Uh, I noticed there's a whole bunch of uh, comments there on the side. If you have further comments, uh, please uh, feel free to put them in uh, the Facebook feeds and we'll get back to them. Uh, we will be coming to you again next week, as I've said during this discussion, with an absolutely crazy story uh, and one that really, it, as I've said, it really makes your toes crawl. We're going to be catching up uh, with... Uh, David Pryor from Daisel Avionics. I uh, had the opportunity to sit down with David and his team today at Bankstown Airport and to learn more about a story that involves really a significant failure by CASA to be able to move uh, move them forward and has done all manner of uh, damage to both the, uh, the product and the company. And so we'll be catching up with David uh, and his team and Ken Kinane will be joining us again uh, for that discussion. Uh, just also, I, I am being inundated, as you would imagine, inundated with people coming forward wanting to participate in these Facebook Live uh, panel discussions. Uh, and I appreciate everyone reaching out and wanting to be part of the conversation because it's, it's critical. It's actually quite critical that we now start talking about many of the problems that have gone on inside of the aviation industry and the role that the Civil Aviation Safety Authority has played uh, in those. And I'd also like to just communicate to those within the Civil Aviation Safety Authority that might be watching these programs or reviewing them, uh, that we are certainly not doing this to rubbish uh, CASA and, and its involvement in these actions, but we're doing them because it's time that many of these issues are spoken about publicly so that we, the industry, and you, the regulator, can learn. You can learn from these mistakes and that you, as the regulator of this industry, can show leadership uh, on these issues by seeing to it that many of these problems and lacks and I guess failures of communication and dealing with the industry can be rectified. Uh, and I hope that whilst on some of these topics the issues will be confrontational and certainly it will raise many difficult questions that will require to be answered, I, I hope that for the vast majority of people inside of CASA that you understand that we're actually trying to help the industry and we're trying to help you. We're trying to give you the opportunity uh, to see to it that these types of things need to be addressed because we want to see the Australian aviation industry succeed. We don't want to see aviation fail. We want to see it move forward. And so uh, whilst we're going to continue to run these programs and uh, at this point in time, I think we have enough content to keep us busy until mid next year sometime with our uh, regular weekly broadcasts. Uh, what we also hope from this is that CASA can take initiative and start to organise some meetings and bring the industry bodies to the table so that we can have a more broad conversation about fixing uh, some of these problems. So thank you very much, everybody, for watching uh, 
the broadcast. Thank you, everyone, for very kind words that you've been sending through to AOPA. We've received a significant amount of email traffic from people thanking us uh, for putting this particular series together. Uh, we do it because we care about our industry. We love aviation. We care deeply about our members, and we want to see the aviation industry put on a, uh, I guess, a playing field and a keel that enables it to go forward and to succeed. So thank you, everyone, and we'll be back to you next week on Tuesday.